Let's get you to the weekend. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market just about positive. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York, coming up, Biden-McCarthy meeting delayed as aides make progress. Yellen putting it on Congress to address the debt limit as one Fed governor keeps the door open for more hikes. We begin with the big issue. It's just getting started. The debt ceiling debate. It's mostly a political game. Nobody wants to make difficult decisions on spending cuts or tax increases. It's very hard to, uh, to, to move anything forward or stop anything. It would be catastrophic to, uh, to not raise the ceiling. This really is an issue that needs to be resolved in the next few weeks. It's going to get resolved, but it's going to get really noisy in the interim. This is something that we're very focused on. Definitely there is distortions in the T-bill market as a result. There are a lot of people pounding the table about T-bills around the X state. You have uh, five trillion, six trillion nearly in, in assets and money market funds. And they're all being moved around to try to adjust for this potential stress. We're all just waiting, we're watching. This is gonna go right down to the last minute. Everybody is sick to death of this already. Joining us now is Sokjen, Sabatra Shapa, Aberdeen's Luke Hickmore. Sabatra, first to you. I know everyone's exhausted by this, but it's only just getting started. When you speak to clients at the moment, what are you telling them? Well, I'm telling them that there's a that regardless of all the stresses that you're seeing in the bond market, ultimately the the, the Treasury and and the Congress, uh, as well as the President, have to work towards a, a resolution and get the debt ceiling passed on time. Uh, having even a technical default is not an option for uh, the U.S. government. So. Um, you know, that said, I think that it's going to get down to the wire, as your guests were saying earlier on. You know, you're starting to see stresses in the, in the, in the bond market. Uh, Treasury bills uh, that are maturing in early June are starting to cheapen out quite meaningfully. Uh, and also, if you look at the extraordinary measures that, that Janet Yellen has been posting on uh, the Treasury website, there's not a whole lot of room for the, for the Treasury to get past perhaps the, the first week of June. So in this sort of context, I think that uh, time is of essence and Congress has to act relatively quickly to raise the debt ceiling. Luke, in America right now, we're kind of up to our neck in it. Knee deep, if you will, sinking and fast and sick of it. Look, from an ex-US perspective, for someone outside of America right now, how do you view these issues as they bubble away once more? Well, one, I'm glad it's not the guilt market for change. Uh, we went through <laughs> our stress last year. Um, but we, we're as worried about it as everybody else. We feel it's going to get sorted like everybody else. We feel we're going to go through the volatility before it happens. But, but I wonder, with that pushing up at the front end of the yield, yield market, that's going to attract deposits even more than we've seen already, and possibly one of the reasons why PacWest was so weak yesterday. Um, does this suck more of the lifeblood at the smaller regional banks as, as it just gets better and better value to, to go into the money market in the front end of the curve? Uh, Luke, are you suggesting that one issue can just bleed into the other? Uh, yes, for sure. And, you know, that, that, that impact that we're going to get through the rest of the economy and everything else, uh, it, it feels pretty intense at the moment, doesn't it, Jonathan? It's a massive, massive issue, Sebastian. I think a major question for a lot of people would be this one. A Treasury something I run towards, seek safety in, or something I run away from? Uh, that's a very good question. It really depends on what issue you're running into or running away from. I think people are running away from uh, you know, any sort of security that would mature in uh, early June or even you know, June and July um, because of the fact that you know, money market funds especially um, are concerned about investing in securities where there could be a, a no payment or, or delayed payment, uh, if you will. So there's, they're definitely trying to avoid those securities. But on the long end, I think what you typically tend to see in an environment like this is that investors flock to the safety of, of uh, long end treasuries because it, your treasuries are still your safe haven asset. Even over the last week, even though we spent enormous amounts of time talking about the debt ceiling, the belly of the curve, the, the five-year, seven-year, ten-year part of the curve has seen tremendous amounts of, of, of demand and inflows. 
and that part of the curve is training very very rich on the on uh, on the yield curve so you you're talking about a demand uh, for some uh, securities in, in the treasury curve and not not others because of the debt ceiling this is the one issue that we've got to address luke if things get dicey they get messy i'd have one question for everybody are you a buyer of the u.s 10 year or not buyer of the u.s five year uh, over the 10 year uh, if you have to buy the 10 year because there's nothing else you really fancy that's fine um, there's no cross default clause as i understand it here if a t-bill t-bill goes you're still money good on your five year and your 10 year and you have to believe it gets sorted out over that time span look out of interest why the belly of the curve why the five year i think that's the point that you start seeing the curve re-steepen up so if we get to the point, as, as we expect, and many do now, that yields are falling end of the year, interest rates are coming down, that curve goes from inversion back to steepening. I'd like to be in the five-year to get the best out of that and avoid a lot of the volatility right at the front. A five-year this morning, 337, yields up by about a basis point, no drama there. Ten-year up about a basis point, just sub 340 there. A little bit earlier this morning, we caught up with the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. She's basically doubling down on her message and sticking to script. Take a listen. If Congress doesn't raise the debt ceiling, we face economic and financial catastrophe one way or the other. The only good outcome is one in which Congress acts. If Congress fails to do that, it really impairs our credit rating. We have to default on some obligation. That's something America hasn't done since 1789, and we shouldn't start now. AMH joins us right now. Anne-Marie, you spoke to the Treasury Secretary in Japan ahead of this G7. Did we learn anything this morning? Well, she's pretty blunt that if the debt ceiling isn't raised, they will default on something. The key question, though, Jonathan, is what will they prioritize with the cash they do have left on their balance sheet? And this is something she didn't really want to get into because obviously this is very political. But she did say at this point she has not had this talk about prioritization yet with the president of the United States. And we're less than three weeks now to what she first outlined as the beginning that we could potentially see a default as of June 1st. And when it comes to that timeline, she also said it's very uncertain precisely how much cash Treasury has. And at some point when she gets new information, she will be updating Congress. AMH, fantastic exchange. Really enjoyed the exchange this morning. The conversation between Anne-Marie and the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Look out for that on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal as well. Just to get you up to speed on some news, confirming, I think, for many of you what you already knew and saw in reports elsewhere. The Washington Post saying that Elon Musk has picked NBC Universal's Linda Yaccarino to be the new Twitter CEO. Some confirmation from the Washington Post this morning. That just crossed in a wire moments ago. We'll try and pick up on that story a little bit later for you. Back with us on the bond market in this debt ceiling drama, Sabatra Japa, Luke Hickmore. Sabatra, we've talked often over the last few weeks. I've benefited from your insight. You've maintained this bias towards lower yields through the long end. Is that a bias you retain even this morning? We do, but it feels like at this point the market has gone uh, gotten a little ahead of itself. We've seen a pretty dramatic decline in, in yields. You look at the fundamentals. Uh, you, we got inflation this week. Core CPI is still running around five and a half percent year over year, uh, and the labor market is relatively strong. So if you kind of separate yourself from what's going on in the debt ceiling, it feels like the market is pricing in too much by way of of cuts for this year. The rally in the belly, uh, perhaps because of the debt ceiling issues, again feels like it's a little bit, a uh, little bit too, too much. And uh, you know, in this sort of context, I'm a little bit more cautious about uh, in recommending longs. We're neutral on on rates here. We could perhaps see a leg up in yields if we do get a resolution on the debt ceiling. Um, so we're cautious here. But I think the broader trend for the remainder of the year is going to be tightening credit conditions, which would mean. That, you, that yields should start to gradually decline over the remainder of the year. Well, Luke, you're looking for a move. 280 on a 10-year by year-end. Is that still the move you're looking for, Luke? Yeah, I'm happy with that. Maybe, you know, 280, 290. It'll be below three. That's, that's, that's the big call, I guess. And, and I, I kind of agree with, with your, other, uh, your other guests here today, but we're, we're in a range. 
and we're at the bottom of that range, the market will trade it and we'll move wider and, and higher in terms of yields in the short term, I'm sure, if we get past the debt ceiling. Um, but that doesn't get away from that recession still hitting us in the second half of the year. And even if it's not a recession, in, in the purest sense of the term, it could feel like it as nominal growth starts to come down, revenues get hit, and company profitability could be actually quite hard to come by as we go through the second half of 2023. So, yes. Well, especially when nominal growth has been so high for so long. A sub-3 yeah. 285 call makes sense if you're expecting a severe slowdown. Now, Sabatra, I want to go back to your recession call in 2024. You made that about a year or so ago, Sabatra. How are things panning out to what you expected? Absolutely. It's pretty much going as our economists had, had uh, penciled in and expected. Um, you know, they also, our economists also have the unemployment rate uh, around 4% for, for the end of the year, not 4.5%. So broadly speaking, I think the, the labor market is still relatively strong and, and resilient. Growth has been you know, relatively uh, strong as well. So in this sort of context, at least as of now, where corporate profit margins are, Corporate profit margins are still relatively healthy. So um, I think for the most part, most of the metrics that we had penciled in are tracking as uh, we had expected. So I think we're still looking towards a 2024, early 2024 recession. Really what brings that timeline forward is if we do see uh, a tightening of credit conditions if the banking uh, sector comes under a lot of pressure. We got the senior uh, the loan officer survey uh, this week. I mean, loan demand is starting to decline. Uh, I think the tightening of credit conditions could pull forward that timeline for recession to later this year, as Luke has said. And for now, we're still holding on to our early 2024 uh, call for a recession. That moving claims notable this week, that's for sure. Your equity market right now positive 0.26% on the S&P. We're about 20 minutes out from the open and bow. Sabatra so Japa, Luke Hickmore are going to stick with us. Let's get you some movers. We can get you some stocks ahead of the open. Here's Abby. Hey John, let's start out with the shares of Tesla. Those investors like the idea that they're going to get potentially more attention from CEO Elon Musk. This, of course, on the news that Twitter is going to have a new full-time CEO in about six weeks. And we did, of course, just have that breaking news that the Washington Post is reporting that it will be Linda Yasserino, the chairman and advertiser and partnerships over at NBC Universal. She's been there for more than 10 years, making her an interesting choice is she could have political implications of making the Twitter platform more neutral as opposed to the way that it could be viewed right now in terms of a little bit of, uh, I guess, conservative leaning. I don't know, maybe I'm getting into hot water here, but she would be an interesting choice. And uh, Ella Irwin, who also had been floated, it seems as though perhaps she's not getting the post. PacWest up a little bit today after dropping huge yesterday on last week's uh, fall in deposits of a about 10 percent. And then finally, Fox down 2.4 percent. Uh, we do have Wells Fargo downgrading shares uh, to an equal weight from an overweight after earnings earlier this week, plus strategic uncertainty probably having to do with uh, lawsuit situations, ongoing lawsuit situations, not related to Dominion. And then, of course, the exit of Tucker Carlson and his announcement that he's going to be doing a show on Twitter. Abby, thank you. Putting some stories together for us. Pack West, still half the level. Less than half the level it was at just a couple of Mondays ago. That one just cannot get up, up off the mat. Your equity market right now positive, just about. Coming up on the program, a June hike back in play. I would have thought a pause in, in March would have, would have made sense. A lot of humility is in order. We might need you know, additional hikes. That's certainly a possibility. Fed Governor Michelle Barman putting rate hikes back on the table. That conversation up next. Inflation is the big problem. All of these central banks have shifted to focusing only on mm -hmm. concurrent data. Inflation, 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 that's what matters. At some point, they need to make the shift because they're waiting for these lags and it doesn't work. They're now moving towards a pause. They could pause here. I do think we're in pause territory. Pause and let's wait. I don't know how much of a difference 25 basis points makes at this point. We do think they're going to pause. The Fed is heading towards a pause. That's the growing consensus on Wall Street. Chairman Powell fueling those bets in his latest news conference. If you add up all the tightening that's going on through various channels, it's, it, we, we feel like we, you know, we're getting close or, or maybe even there. But now another Fed official suggesting more hikes could be in the pipeline. 
Governor Michelle Bowman pouring cold water all over Hope's report, saying this. Should inflation remain high and the labour market remain tight, additional monetary policy tightening will likely be appropriate to attain a sufficiently restrictive stance. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, uh, it is not just what uh, you quoted her saying there, but what uh, Michelle Bowman went on to say that really is significant. It seems there's a, quite a bit of disappointment at the Fed of the CPI numbers we just got. Uh, Bowman said uh, inflation, quote, remains much too high and measures of core inflation have remained persistently elevated with declining unemployment and ongoing wage growth. She said, the numbers that came out last week have not provided consistent evidence that inflation is on a downward path. So, in other words, she's ready, perhaps, to raise rates again if we get the same numbers in June for the May in the CPI as we did for April. And it's significant because Michelle Bowman is considered one of the more centrist uh, governors and one who is perhaps most likely to take her cues from the chair. So if she's suggesting that it is on the table, then that is probably the case for the rest of the Fed as well. And so is the next inflation print make or break, Mike McKee, from your standpoint, based on what we're learning from Fed officials? Well, it'll be what they say, the totality of evidence. And we do have another CPI report, as you say. We also have a PCE report, which is their indicator, at the end of uh, this month. And so those two combined with the labor market report we get at the beginning of June, those will be make or break. And I expect we'll hear from other governors and Fed Bank presidents who are going to suggest that, yeah, we're not necessarily done yet. This could turn into yet one more hike if we don't see the numbers between now and then that we're looking for. And then we'll just price in even more cuts after that. Mike McKee, thank you, buddy. Always great to catch up with Mike. Sabatra so Jaffa, Luke Hickmore. With us to weigh in on this, Sabadra, do you sense that Governor Bauman might have some company, like Mike McKee suggested? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the way market participants look at Fed policy action, they think of it as either monotonically, monotonically increasing or monotonically de decreasing. They don't really have a scenario penciled in where the Fed might pause and then have to hike again because of inflation. This is a very unique situation where inflation... Uh, is also not monotonically decreasing. It could be in, in fits and starts. We do see a, a rise in, in inflation uh, when the sort of regional banking issues subside. Then will the Fed hike again? It's, it's, it's unclear. Uh, and the case is not very uh, well defined if they should pause and, and stay on hold for the remainder of the year if inflation actually starts to tick up. So I think that there's definitely a very underpriced risk in the bond market is for a Fed pause uh, and then uh, the Fed resuming hikes later on this year. I just don't see people changing their minds. Two voices that I respect with two different opinions, Bank of America, Mike Gapen, City, Andrew Hollenhorst. Bank of America's Mike Gapen said pause in June. Inflation data comes out, says pause in June. City said hike in June. Inflation comes out, they still say hike in June. Luke Hickman, what's going to change people's minds? So I think uh, data dependent, right? And, and as, as Mike said, it's the totality of what's going to be going along. And, and today's UMISH is just, just in the mix as well about what consumers are thinking about inflation going forward. All of the data that we get between here and the Fed meeting is going to make a difference to people's views. It may not make any difference to the Fed. And in a way, I'm not sure it really matters for markets. If we get one more and then stop, I'm just as relaxed about that as I am as if we stop now and then start, start cutting uh, sooner or later in the year. I, I think the pace of change has really picked up in this cycle. Really quick hiking, probably a short pause and a quick cutting as well uh, through, through that part of this year, early part of next year. Well, Luke, you talked about the totality of the data, so let's talk about it. Not CPI, not payrolls, banks. This is your line on some of the banks. Bank equities. Avoid bank equity perhaps for the next couple of years. Luke, that bad? Yeah, I think it could be. The, the provisioning's good, the capitalization's good. None of that matters. Profitability is going to come under pressure. There's hundreds of years of history of going back at a crisis, looking what the regulator does, how tough do they get? The last one in the GFC, they got really tough. I don't expect it to be that bad this time, but what they will do is hit them in their pocket directly. 
make deposits more expensive, hit their margins, and it makes it hard for the banks to rebuild capital when things are difficult. So I, I really struggle to see how um, it's going to be an enticing place to be for equity investors for the next couple of years until we could get past this next kind of recession slowdown, uh, a, a wave or, or potentially increase in non-performing loans as we go through a downturn uh, and, and get to the other side of it. And could well make it difficult to lend as well, Sabadra. Yeah, so with absolutely. that in mind, just to put a bow on it, final word, Sabadra, how much of this banking stress is going to do the hard work for this Fed? So we think it's about maybe uh, 50 to 75 basis points of heights uh, is, is what this banking crisis is amounting to. And that's probably why the Fed is, is, is thinking about pausing uh, a lot sooner than people had anticipated earlier on uh, this year. But I completely agree with, with Luke. I think it's going to be a tightening of credit conditions. We've seen this uh, playbook before. Uh, but it's also going to be a story of haves and have-nots, where some of the larger banks that are seeing deposit inflows are well cap capitalized, have a lot more liquidity, are going to be in a better position in this, this time around, as opposed to some of the smaller regional banks that not only really are being burdened with a lot of regulation, but also don't have uh, the same uh, capital and liquidity uh, in, in place uh, and are seeing uh, and continuing to see deposit outflows. So uh, it's going to be very interesting how this, this credit crunch plays out in the next several months. Sabatra Schapper, Luke Hickmore, to the two of you, two of the very best. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. I get the call. It's just happening much more slowly than we anticipated. We've hiked rates from zero through five very quickly in a little more than 12 months. I think a lot of people thought we'd do more damage to the labor market than we have. Unemployment's still in at around three and a half percent. Banking stress the last couple of months. I think a lot of people thought bang, event, we'd see it through tighter lending standards in the slews. We didn't see it in a major way. You're seeing it, but a continuation of the trend that was already there. It's just taking a lot longer than some people thought it would. Coming up on this program, the morning calls in later. This market is heading for a double-digit correction. That's the call from Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. That conversation, seven minutes away. Five minutes away from the beginning of the final trading day of the week. Equity futures positive by 0.3%. Let's get you some morning calls quickly. Here's your first one. Wells Fargo downgrading Fox to equal weight, seeing limited upside with no catalyst on the horizon. Your second call from Argus downgrading Estee Lauder to hold, expecting a slow recovery in China to keep inventories elevated. And finally, Wolf Research downgrading Disney to peer perform, warning that subscriber numbers might not meet the company's targets. That stock just about positive 0.2%. Coming up, preparing for a correction. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo expecting political and economic risk to start weighing on equities. That conversation up next, your opening bell, just around the corner. Twenty seconds away from the start of the final trading day of the week, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures just about positive by 0.3 percent, just about negative on the week through Thursday at the close, and looking to take a bite out of those losses at the opening bell. From New York City, there is your opening bell. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this, just a bit higher, a touch, by not even a basis point. Your 10-year just south of 340, 339. 36, a break of 109 on euro dollar. Some euro weakness starts to get interesting this week. A break of 109 to 108, 89. We're negative 0.25%. Saw some Fed officials out there talking up rate hikes, but will the data go the other way in the next few months in Europe? With everyone on the other side of the boat seemingly focused on the United States, is Europe something you need to keep an eye on? Uh, so we're looking at crude, WTI, $71 and about 40 cents. We're positive 0.76% there. About 30 seconds into the session, equities positive by, let's call it 0.25%, quarter of 1% higher on the Nasdaq up by 0.2%. One stock to watch out the open is Fox. The company's ad revenue boost failing to offset legal costs and the fallout from Tucker Carlson's exit. The CEO saying this, there's no change to our strategy. 
We're adjusting our programming and lineup, and that's what we'll continue to do. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, this is an interesting one because they actually put up a pretty decent quarter, especially relative to the peers' top line growth of about 18%. Now, on the bottom line, though, profits shrunk by about 21%. That has everything to do with that Dominion lawsuit that they did uh, settle a few weeks ago. They were also unfazed by a more difficult advertising backdrop, in part because of the Super Bowl. We do, of course, though, today have Wells Fargo downgrading shares, and the stock is down for a fourth day in a row. In fact, on the quarter, it's down about 10 percent. It's worst quarter in about a year or so. So there's this perception around, I would say, so many different issues around Fox. That lawsuit was settled. They have another one that they are contending with, I think, that they're planning on fighting. And then, of course, there was the exit, the firing of Tucker Carlson not so long ago. Tucker Carlson has come back out saying that he plans on launching his own show on Twitter. So the idea of contention or strife perhaps weighing on these shares, the idea that there could be an unknown. But when you actually take a look at the numbers, uh, yes, we do have uh, that lawsuit that weighed on uh, the profits for the past quarter, but it's not clear if that's going to be the case. I think most analysts, in fact, would say uh, that the fundamental business for Fox is pretty solid in terms of the revenue that they have put up and that they may be able to do that. Plus, they have Tubi, which apparently is doing well. So lots of different mixed uh, signals to take a look at around Fox. But take note of the fact that, again, down for a fourth day in a row and on the quarter down 10 percent, the worst quarter uh, going back about a year or so, John. That's an ugly quarter, Abby. Thanks. Thanks for that. Not too much drama on the intraday price this morning with negative 0.5%, $30 and about 50 cents. This is where the drama's been, the financials. The regional banks are looking to stabilize following another volatile week of trading. PacWest plunging 22% on Thursday after reporting its most recent deposit results. Kaylee Lines has been on top of this for us over the last couple of months. Morning, Kaylee. Good morning, John. Well, on those deposit results, they said that last week deposits dropped $9.5 billion after the news that the company was exploring its strategic options. Big drop in the stock yesterday and really struggling to gain traction on this Friday morning session. The stock has been fluctuating between gains and losses really since pre-market trading opened. Right now, up about 1%. We'll see if it sticks. And remember, this is still a stock that remains down the better part of 80% on a year-to-date basis and is still set for a third consecutive week of losses. As for some of the other regional banks we've been paying attention to, Western Alliance, Key Corp, they both were more uh, insulated from some of that selling pressure yesterday, fell between 2 and 2.5%, and, and this morning they also are uh, positive, but only to the tune of about 1% at the moment. Interesting to see that actually it is the larger banks that are underperforming slightly in this session. J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Citi all essentially unchanged on the day, and we do know that it is the bigger banks that the FDIC would like to impose those special assessment fees on. We got that proposal yesterday. They got a big hole to fill in the deposit insurance fund, and they want to put the big guys on the hook for it, John. We'll see if we get more regulatory clarity in the coming week. There's going to be two key hearings in the Senate Banking Committee next week, one with the executives from the failed Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, another with Marty Grunberg from the FDIC, Fed Vice Chair Michael Barr, and other regulators next Thursday. It's going to be another big wink for banking news, I would imagine, John. Kaylee, do you get the sense that we're taking our eye off the ball, just a little bit distracted by the debt ceiling stuff when this is still ongoing? Yeah, it's a really good question because obviously that is the primary objective of Congress at the moment is to get that debt ceiling lifted. And I would note, John, that it is now more than two months after the failures of these banks and they're just now getting to the testimony of these executives. It doesn't seem like there is much forward progress to be made on some kind of congressional legislative action uh, on the banks at the moment. It may be something that has to come just from the regulators themselves, John. Kelly, thank you. Two months. Unbelievable. I know everyone loves to hate the 08 comparison, so... Let's love to hate this from Michael Hartner, Bank of America. Here's the line from him this morning. The S&P 500 up 11%, the Nasdaq up 15% in the two months after Bear Stearns failed in March 2008. The S&P 500 up 7%, the Nasdaq up 10% in the two months after SVB failed too. There's a call in his note this morning. I'll return to and catch up with Chris Harvey about of Wells Fargo in just a moment. I wanted to get one more stock, Tesla. Getting a lift after raising prices on most of their U.S. vehicles, the company's third round of changes in less than a month. A tweet from Tesla CEO Elon Musk also boosting sentiment this morning, writing the following, excited to announce that I've hired a new CEO for Twitter. She will be starting in six weeks. Ed Ludlow joins us on the West Coast now. Now, Ed, I've got this from NBC Universal, their yes. latest press release this morning. <laughs> Linda Yasserino to leave NBC Universal. Are we just waiting for Twitter to say... Linda Yasserina was joining Twitter. Yes, we are just waiting for someone to say that, that Linda Yasserina is joining Twitter. NBC Universal says her departure is effective 
Immediately, the Wall Street Journal reported on Thursday that Elon Musk has selected Yaccarino as the next CEO of Twitter. The Washington Post and Puck have also reported, citing sources, that she is the new CEO of Twitter. That's supporting Tesla shares as it did in Thursday's session with the idea that Elon Musk will be more focused on his other companies outside of Twitter, although he did say in that tweet that you showed, John, that he will be focused on the technical and product side of Twitter as CTO. Two other big factors playing out in Tesla shares this Friday. Uh, the first, as you noted, raising prices here in the U.S. more modestly by $250 on the Model Y, more significantly by around $1,000 on Model S, but the base price nowhere near where it was to start the year. We'd also note a recall of 1.1 million vehicles in China. It is a soft recall. They've identified an issue with regenerative braking that will be fixed via over-the-air update, so not a, a recall in the traditional sense. But either way, stock up 2.6%, highest level in around three weeks on Tesla. And again, we can use it as a somewhat of a proxy for Twitter, the private company. Reasons to like it this morning. Ed, thank you. On the West Coast, reasons to like it for Dan Ives of Wedbush, who has liked this company for a while. He says this will benefit shares of Tesla, writing the following. Musk's reign as CEO of Twitter has finally come to an end and thus will be a positive for Tesla stock, starting to finally remove this lingering arbitrage from the story. We maintain our outperform rating and ultimately view this as a major step forward. Tesla this morning trading positively. As for the equity market, the broader equity market, well, here's a call from Chris Harvey as Wells Fargo, sounding the alarm on equity, saying this, market gains continue to be dominated by Uber cabs, masking the fact that 48% of S&P 500 stocks are down year to date. We remain near-term bearish as the focus shifts from Q1 earnings to a macro fraud with economic and political risk. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo joins us right now. Chris, buddy, always great to catch up with you, sir. Let's start there with that call. Can you tell me, when you speak to clients, are they more concerned about the next three months or what's coming in 2024? I would say they're more concerned about what's happening today, tomorrow, in the very short term. They're skipping over what's going to happen over the next three, four, five months, and then they're looking at 2024. It's one of the oddest things I've seen in a while. And the other thing that clients are doing is they're telling me they're bearish, but when you walk down the bearish scenarios, they dismiss every single one. Debt ceiling, ah, that'll get resolved. <laughs> Student loans, ah, not big enough, don't worry about that. Earnings season, better than expected. Fed, Fed, ah, Fed's done. Banking situation, ah, that's a one-off. And so it's, it's very, very odd that what you're seeing is people discounting or people just looking very short-term, very long-term, and discounting the macro to a large degree. So, Chris, what's behind your call then for a correction of, what, 5 to 10 percent on the S&P? Yeah. Yeah, so coming into this year, our year-end price target is 4,200. It's um, 20 times uh, 210 number. We more or less got there a couple, couple days ago, a couple weeks ago. I think we got to 4,180 and change intraday, right? Much of what we thought was going to play out has already played out. And now we had had a better than expected earnings season, but that's over. And now we're going to turn to the macro, and the macro is not pretty. We're going to be playing brinkmanship with a debt ceiling. I think it'll get done, but it's not that it will get done. It's how it will get done. And we'll probably push this to the 11th hour because the GOP wants spending cuts. And this is one of the few things where they have leverage. So it's in their best incentive to push this to the end. That's not going to be great for sentiment. That's not going to be great for the economy. The other thing is, at some point, we're going to get a decision on student loan and student loan forgiveness. We think the odds favor students have to pay things back and there won't be forgiveness. That's going to be a significant hit or potentially could be a significant hit to sentiment and also to spending. And, and then we can roll down, roll down a number of things. But when we look at the longer term, we just don't see. We have a 20 multiple at this point in time. We need EPS to go a lot higher to get pretty bullish and we just don't see that at this point in time. Chris, I think you'd understand, recognize, sympathize maybe even with people who have sat here and said, I've heard so much of this before. I've heard it quarter after quarter after a decent quarter of earnings that we're going to see some weakness in the economic data. And at the moment, Chris, what they now face is whether there is this tradable window, so to speak, between a Fed pause, if this is indeed a Fed pause, and the economic weakness that really hasn't asserted itself just yet. Is there a window there and how big is it? Right. Yeah, so, John, a couple of things there. It, 
it always takes longer for things to play out on Main Street than it does on Wall Street. On Wall Street, sometimes it happens in, in minutes, hours, days. On, uh, on Main Street, it takes weeks, months, quarters. So it'll take a while for some of the, the issues in the banking sector to filter through. It'll take a while. It's been taking a while for monetary policy to, to take hatch. But it's going to take hatch. We did have a better than expected earnings season. But one of the things that, that we've noticed is sales growth isn't great. When we look at the consumer, consumer's okay, but it's the consumer's behavior that we're worried about. If you look at real retail sales, for the last five months, you've had negative real retail sales. You had one month where it was fantastic, but that's not a great trend. If you keep looking at the TV, you keep looking at the headlines, these are not positive for, for sentiment. So we do think you're, in the second half of this year is when things start to unfold and, and when the market begins to react to, to some of the negative news, and especially on the macro side. Chris, I'd love your response reaction to what Michael Hartner of Bank of America had to say earlier this morning. I shared a piece of his quote. I'll share the full part of his note right now. Just this little snippet. SPX up 11 percent, Nasdaq up 15 percent, and the two months after Bear Stearns failed back in March 08. S&P 500 up 7 percent, Nasdaq up 10 percent in the two months after SVB has gone under. He says recession will crack credit and tech just as it did back in 2008. He goes on to say actually that a negative payroll print would likely be a by catalyst yeah. for cyclicals in 23. But can we focus on credit and tech just on the tech piece of that? Chris, when yeah. you talk about 5 to 10 percent corrections and the prospect of maybe clients needing to de-risk, what does de-risking look like to you? What are you advocating for? Is it trim tech, yeah. trim cyclicals? What is it? So what it means to us is you want to trim risk, so your higher risk positions, also your more cyclical positions. In addition to that, we, we've said this all year long, you want to take value off the table because we are going to have some sort of economic impact. One of the things that, and, and this is a little bit goes against the grain, is the Uber caps have done really well year to date. We're looking at the Uber caps and we talk about Uber caps. Um, Russell has a top 50 um, index that we use. And if you look at that index, the premium that you're paying for that index is only 10, 15%. And you're getting pretty stable earnings and pretty stable growth. So we think the Uber caps will still outperform in the short term, maybe because everything goes down and they go down less. But really what we want to avoid, what we want to take off the table, it's risk, it's cyclicality, it's value. Equities right now doing okay, positive 0.3%. Chris, stick with us. I want a final word from you on the banks, if that's okay. Because coming up, the big banks face some big bills. The regional banks have been under some stress. I will be meeting with senior bankers uh, next week when I get back. That conversation, up next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Lyft CEO David Risher. That conversation at 1.30 p.m. Eastern and 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The regional banks have been under some stress, but I think the banks that have failed have had some very unique characteristics that have made them vulnerable. The amount that they're having to pay for deposits is rising, mm -hmm. and in many cases their investments are at lower interest, and their stock prices are coming under pressure. I will be meeting with senior bankers uh, next week when I get back. Secretary Yellen set to meet with bank executives for the first time in a long time. This coming as the FDIC prepares to hit the biggest lenders with some big bills. The government's deposit insurance fund needs to refill to the tune of nearly 16 billion. And they want the big banks on the hook. Jeffrey is expecting that to translate into a 2.5% annual hit on EPS across the banks they cover. Shanali Basak has more. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. Let's talk about that Jeffrey's note for a minute because the specificity here is interesting. Remembering that only about 113 banks are supposed to cover this special assessment for the FDIC to cover those uninsured deposits from the systemic risk exemption, about 48 of those firms out of 113 are paying 95% of that special assessment. Now, these are banks of asset sizes of $50 billion or more to get from $15 billion to, $50 billion 
Garage to JP Morgan is a wide range of banks still, even among a smaller number of banks. So those smaller banks, as a percentage of their revenue, that hit would be larger. So again, bigger banks are impacted, but the smallest of those big banks are going to feel the pain the most. And you heard that kind of reflected here by the Jamie Dimons of the world here, that the smaller, mid-sized banks, everything outside of the GCFEs really, are still bearing a lot of compliance costs. And again, this is for the special assessment just for Signature as well as Silicon Valley Bank. This does not include the cost tied to First Republic. Is it possible, Shanali, they pass that cost on to us somehow? Yes, I mean, absolutely, because remember, this cost is not just the special assessment from the FDIC. There's a sense here that as the FDIC really uh, morphs in terms of figuring out how to fill the holes from the banking stresses overall, there's a sense here that the banks will have to pay more in fees just overall, especially the biggest of the big. And then there's a cost tied to any stricter compliance when you look at what is expected from the Federal Reserve and any future regulations as well. Those costs will ultimately come out of our pockets one day, John. Shelley, can't wait. Shanali Bassett with the latest. Thank you. Chris Harvey back with us for a final word. Hey, Chris, I really wanted your insight on this. Shanali's just gone through a bunch of reasons for why I don't really want to own bank stocks, why people at home right now don't want to touch them. Chris, can you give us a good reason why we should own that sector? So we have a neutral on the banking sector. What we're seeing in the banking sector is we are seeing more value being created. The question is, when can you exploit that? And we think the banking sector has to work through a few things. And, and one of the things that was mentioned earlier is EPS and EPS coming down. We think EPS numbers probably need to reset a little bit lower. But we're getting to a point where maybe in the middle of the summer, maybe over the next couple months, if we do get that sell-off, if we do get that reset, then banks look a lot more attractive. But you're, you're beginning to see for a select number uh, a lot more value being uncovered and, and a lot more value being built. We just think it's... Uh, it's not quite time to, to go overweight the group just and Chris, yet. I understand the sensitivity around your role, not to name names, but can you describe features? Are you speaking more towards the regionals where we're creating immense value given the, the crash we've seen in some of these names? Yeah. Is it the large cap names? What kind of banks are they? Yeah. So, so it really depends. So I'll, I'll give you a non-answer, but I'll try not to give you a non-answer. It really depends on who you are. But if you look up the capitalization, there are a lot of really solid banks up there. They're trading at good valuations, and, and they appear to be pretty good risk awards. So if you're a little bit more um, conservative, that's probably where you want to go fishing. If you're going to go down and, and you want to be a little bit more aggressive, there are a number of banks that have some good deposit bases, that have good valuations, that have very good um, credit management, uh, and I think longer term, you know, they've proven that cycle in, cycle out. And now that all the banks are on sale, they look a lot more attractive. But you're right, I can't, I can't go into individual ones. But really what you want to do is, is you want to look for those ones that, that have proven themselves over different cycles, managing credit and credit risk, and, and have done a good job. And, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Chris, I'll let you leave it right there. Chris Harvey, thank you, sir. Wonderful to get your perspective. Chris Harvey there of Wells Fargo looking for that correction on the S&P 500. Somewhere perhaps anywhere between 5 to 10% on the S&P downside. Plenty of reasons for it. There were plenty of reasons for it a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. Remember early March, SVB failing. Stocks rallied through March, rallied through April. We'll see, but it's been frustrating for a lot of the bearish calls that just keep getting pushed out and pushed out a little bit more. On the S&P, about 22 minutes into the session, we are positive 0.2%. On the S&P, on the Nasdaq, we're positive by 0.1%. One name to watch yesterday was PacWest. PacWest crashed by 22.7%. That's a major move lower. You may hate the word crash, but ultimately we're talking about big moves in percentage terms. When you look at dollar terms, this name was a $10 name two Mondays ago at the opening bell. It moved lower to where we are now at about 470. Remember the low in the previous week had a two handle briefly on the 4th of May at about 250. Recovered since then, but just struggling. Half of where it was two Mondays ago and just struggling, sitting there at 4. 74 and taking a beating yesterday after revealing that deposits once again rolled over last week. Let's get you some sector price action. We can do that now with Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, it's pretty interesting because we have the S&P 500 barely higher, up two tenths of one percent, but you have 10 of the 11 sectors higher, but not by a huge amount. Utilities leading the way, so a little bit of defense there, especially given the fact that yields aren't doing all that much, uh, so it's not really an opposite play as it might be typically. Information technology down ever so slightly, so a broad-based small gain for the S&P 500. There's one stock I want to take a look at. I know we normally look at sectors here, so this would be the 
consumer discretionary sector. Amazon.com yesterday up for an eighth day in a row, the longest winning streak since 2018. Right now down on the day, but let's see whether or not it happens. This play for safety showing up in big tech, John. It's quite a move. Tech looking resilient. Abby, thank you. And performing really well year to date against expectations after taking a beating through 2022. Let's try and get you to the weekend. Up next, here's your trading diary. Twenty-six minutes into the session, on the session up by just 0.2 percent. On the week now, positive just by 0.1 percent. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary coming up. Top of the hour, you, Mitch, consumer sentiment survey, Fed speak through the day. Daily Bullard, Jefferson on deck. Looking ahead to next week, Tuesday, retail sales, followed by the Senate Banking Committee holding a hearing on SVB. Plus Tesla kicking off its annual shareholder meeting and finally rounding out the week with Biden attending the G7 Leaders Summit in Hiroshima. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV and good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.